позитивные изменения в программах раннего обучения ухода за детьми и вмешательства Канада. Лень Франкель. Предоставляю слово первому докладчику. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I welcome the opportunity of sharing my experiences with you about early childhood intervention in Australia. Um, this was a paper that I recently published with um, the support of Denise Lescom on the in, in the Infant and Young um, Child Journal that's edited by Mary Beth Bruder. Um, basically, what I wanted to do today is you through our experiences um, implementing early intervention from a policy perspective today. Um, so this paper really aimed to look at exploring and assessing and evaluating the Australian context of policy in early childhood intervention. Um, Australia is located in the southern hemisphere. We've got six states and two territories, as you can see marked on the map on your other side, I hope, on my right side. <laughs> um, what I wanted to point to you, although we have a mass uh, space of land, that people in Australia live on the outskirts of the continent, and we don't have many people living in the midst of the continent itself. Um, this slide shows you a bit of a breakdown of the cities and the population in each city. I won't go through them, but you can see Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, and so forth. Um, the population in Australia currently sits at about 20 million people. Okay, let's get into disability and working with children with developmental delay. Um, the population of people with um, a diagnosed disability or special needs or developmental delay is about 4 million people. Um, of that number, there is 7.2% of children aged 0 to 14 diagnosed with a disability or a delay. 57% um, have a, diagnosed, a profound diagnosis with severe disability. A further 11% have identified disability with restrictions in attending schools and about 14% of the diagnosed don't have a restriction so they can attend um, mainstream settings. If we look closely in the Australian Index um, for um, children in early development, we've got about, if we translate the percentages into numbers, it comes down to 11,484 children having a chronic physical or intellectual or medical needs. And we've got about 34,893 um, children with developmental difficulties not others otherwise specified. Okay, so a bit about the history of early intervention in Australia. Um, Really early intervention started about in the early 1970s and the idea started with families and professionals working in a cottage style. So people who were interested in supporting children with developmental delay or disability worked together with families to, to create a space for the children to develop and learn in a prospective way. Um, it was not until 2008 that the Commonwealth in Australia decided to actually take a stance in supporting children and their families. So a lot of the policy development in Australia only started around the year 2008. Uh, that creates a really huge problem in, in the Australian context because the majority of research that we borrow from comes from the United States. So we lack the local context of Australian evidence-based research. Um, and that's really hard because we, we borrow stuff from Mary Beth Bruder, from Carl Dunst, from Michael Gramic, and the very big names. Um, and we know that these systems of research really works in the US. 
but there is no guarantee for those systems to work in our country in Australia. A big example of that is the family centric practices. You know, if you don't have enough resources available to support you in implementing a family centered approach of intervention, then you're not going to provide a family centric practice. You're going to have resentful practitioners and you're going to have very angry parents. So um, we're still really young in the implementation of early intervention, although we started in the 70s. So this is just to give you a bit of an idea. Now, we also have main, what I call foundation issues. Um, our mainstream program sits on one side of its own, in isolation from early intervention. We talk a lot about mainstream and mainstreaming children with developmental delay or disability and having inclusive settings for all children and their families. But in reality, when you look at our policies, um, the research that we've done recently across the six states, um, we found out that actually no, in each, um, in each state, the services for children with additional needs are sitting in isolation of mainstream um, education and care. Actually, in fact, in 2012, our professional body of early childhood education and care has decided to put their hands with Early Childhood Intervention Australia, and they together came up with an inclusion statement to encourage professionals on both ends to work together to provide inclusive settings for the young children. Now, this is fantastic on a theoretical basis, but when you go to the grounds and you start applying for funds, have these children attend a mainstream setting, that's where you find the challenges. So these children might still end up going to special education or specialized services and fail to attend the mainstream system. I just wanted to give you an example. This is an example of um, Victoria. This is Melbourne, Victoria. And this shows you how we have actually um, the services, the kindergarten started from playgroups. If you look at the green color in the middle, you see we have playgroups, we have childcare services, we have kindergarten programs, and we have other education and care services. On the side of that, if you go all the way to the left of me, you see a preschool field officer, inclusion support officer. These are all special education trained people that work in the mainstream setting to support the children. But again, they have their own arm of services, so they're not sitting in the early childhood program. They're outside, we borrow them, okay? If you look at the other side, on my right side, you will see specialized services, and this is what early intervention is all about. These are the other services. So you can see the isolation in all the programs that are provided to children. Now I want you to think of that and keep in mind parents and families who are raising a child with a developmental delay or disability trying to access services. If they go to play groups, does that mean that they're going to get all the services they need? The answer is no. Because we are isolated. We don't need services. Okay. So um, I'm going to, my paper links quite strongly with the developmental system approach by Guralnik. And the purpose of the paper was to actually map our services against the system model and see where we stand. Um, so I'm going to look at point of access. I'm going to look at um, comprehensive interdisciplinary assessment. And I'm going to look at the implementation of programs, uh, monitoring and evaluation, and transition points and entering to ECI and the disability sector. I'll walk you through this very quickly. Um, this was a very interesting mapping exercise that I did uh, with the help of many colleagues because if, if you want to imagine this, Australia is the one country with six states and two territories, but we function as six different countries. Okay? And you'll, you'll understand now why we do function that way. If you look at pathways to determine access to early childhood intervention, um, you'll come to the realization that we do not have any formal screening or referral process to identify children with developmental delay or disability. This means that if you're in Victoria and your child got diagnosed with autism and you cross 
to another state, which is only a few hours away from you, um, you may not qualify for funding for early intervention. The, the child has to go through the systems again and get the diagnosis. Now that's a huge challenge because even if we put policies together at a national level, that doesn't mean that the implementation of those programs on a state level are going to go quite cohesively or successfully. This gives you an example of the screening timelines. So you can see Western Australia versus Queensland. Um, Western Australia, the first screening happens between birth and 10 days. Queensland have birth to 10 days and one to four weeks. So the, the system is quite fragmented in the way when we do screenings and when we allow for pathways to take place. If we look at point of access to services, again, at a national level, we don't have any clear guidelines to support access to early childhood intervention. Each state has its own programs and it has its own policies um, in accessing services. Um, in fact, each state has its own department that stipulates where funding goes and how it's distributed. And this is a good example that shows you where funding comes from. So if we're looking at the Australian Capital Territory, we can find out that funding body is the Disability ACT and Education and Training uh, Directory. But if you look at Victoria, for instance, the funding comes from the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development. What this means is that it depends on whether you sit under health or disability or education or care, the policies are always going to be different and the way you access services are going to be different. So the influence is quite uh, varied. When we look at comprehensive assessments, again, you might have guessed this, um, we do not have a particular way of getting children assessed at a national level. Um, each uh, parent or family or foster family is asked to seek support from doctors, what we call general practitioners or pediatricians or specialized nurses to start the motion of getting the assessment started. Now what we have that is quite unique and I really adore, and this has only started in about 2009, we've got a website called Raising Children Network. And this network is being funded by, nationally by the government. And it allows for parents and for families and educators as well to access all the services available for them online. So you can go there and choose the state and ter or territory where you are look at the services, map them, and as a parent, if anything, that builds the capacity of families and gives them ownership of the trajectory of their child. You know, we, we talk about parents and their role in raising a child with a developmental delay or a disability, but as a professional, if we really are going to support families, we really need to allow them to be. You know, and, and that website allows them to be. It gives them control, it gives them the ability to manage the services, gives them knowledge and information. So that's one of the most powerful services, like, services available for parents. Now, the tricky part in getting the diagnosis is that there is not such a clear pathway. So some, some of the children get diagnosed um, because they went for a speech pathologist because they suspected that there was a speech disorder there. And then the speech pathologist goes and refers the child to another person because she believes there is auditory processing issues, so you get an OT uh, referral. So you get two or three people um, in the loop trying to assess what's going on with the child. Um, and that's when early intervention kind of sort of kicks in. But the main comprehensive assessment of young children actually happens when they're accessing early intervention services for them. But before that, it's quite like whatever the parent experiences might be one person, two people, it might be just a pediatrician. Okay. This diagram just shows you where um, the parent and the child sits in the beginning and how if you go with the arrows that you might start as a parent suspecting that your child has a 
delay of some sort. So I'm going to consult with a doctor or a health nurse and then I might just straight away go to a child specialist and then I'm going to go and get my diagnosis and then I go to services. But that may not be the case really all the time. You might end up going straight away from the, um, the pediatrician, get your diagnosis, jump all the way and go to receive your services. Thank you. Um, looking at eligibility and service provision, um, we actually, when looking at determining eligibility, we actually do not have a streamlined um, policy that says how children are, um, how do children qualify for services across the board. Um, and this is quite uh, problematic, and I'll show you why. This is a research that took me a whole year um, to do. And if I stick here, you can see the different states and territories right there. And you can see the eligibility guidelines. And I'm happy to, to give this PowerPoint to you guys to share with interested people so they can find the information they need um, at a later point. But you can see how the guidelines for each state are quite different. Um, and, and, and this is quite troublesome because we cannot unify early intervention. We cannot provide a productive service if we cannot, at a national level, articulate what is early intervention, who is early intervention for, and what's the role of families in intervention. So it's quite problematic for us. Um, the guidelines that, that are similar across the states is that we all believe in family-centered practices. So we all work on building um, families' capacities. Now, let me, let me just uh, make this very clear. Some people are better than others in implementing family-centered practices. There are many who talk about uh, the lip service. So I know what family-centered practice is, but on the ground it's too difficult to implement. But there are people there uh, that are legendary and they do the best they do so they can support family. Okay. I also would like to share with you transitioning points. A lot of people think of transition when children transition from early years to school. Um, that's not the only intervention transition that children go through with their families. That happens, but again, with that happening, we again have different policies in place, and um, it, it, which, which makes me articulate that again, transitioning experiences are going to be different across the different states. What we need to really be careful about is the transition within systems in early intervention. When children are born, they go through that trauma with their family of getting the diagnosis. That's called the clinical journey of services. But then from then on, what happens is we go from the clinical side of things to the ecological side of things, where now we need to think about the child in a social context. So as part of their family, as part of the system, schools, programs, community. And that transition doesn't really happen quite well in Australia. Okay, quick conclusion. What, you can, what I can tell you or what you have, may have gathered by now is that we have the best intention in providing early intervention services and supports to families, but there's still a huge issue with the lack of consistency across the states, because that, and that makes it quite challenging for all of us as practitioners, as people who teach at a university level and as authors that write um, papers and academics, because we can't change what people cannot acknowledge. So it's, it's a serious trajectory that we need to work on. So Kim and Hayes in 2005 said this is still a challenging state for early intervention. And I say in 2013 that is still the case. Um, what we need to work on are three um, things. The first one is the national policy. We need a framework specifically for children with developmental delay or disability or children at risk and not just mainstream children. We need to really pay attention to the service provision uh, for families and communities to support children with developmental delay or disability. There is so much that we can say <coughs> about working with children with developmental delay or disability, but if we don't secure the resources or the professionals to work um, with the families and children, we will not achieve as much as we want to. And the resources not necessarily to monitor it, sometimes it's time 
Sometimes it's professional development. Sometimes it's conversation and dialogue, but we don't even have the time for that. And uh, the last thing um, is basically, if we are to provide inclusive practice and, and talk about inclusion, then let's do the right thing and define what inclusion and inclusive practice is all about so we can achieve a more effective program for these young people. Thank you so much.